Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today. We've got a great topic lined up. We're here to talk about SIM, the market overall, and hopefully providing you with some insights into how to best break down all the multitude of different solutions that exist in the market today. Now, if you have a question, feel free to put that in the chat. We'll gladly handle any of the questions that come in at the end of the presentation. So first up, I'm Chris O'Brien. I lead product marketing at Devo. And today I'm joined by Jason Michael, who's our field chief technology officer. Jason has 30 plus years of experience holding leadership positions at Rapid7, Fidelis, Resolution One Security, and several others. Jason, I wanna thank you for being here today. Thanks, Chris, great to be here. Wonderful, so let's get into the agenda. And again, we're looking to have a great conversation about the market. And I think this is a well-timed discussion because there's been a lot of merger and acquisition activity that's been going on. And as a result, this may have you looking around, whether or not you're impacted by the M&A, or you're just curious to see what other solutions there are out there given the latest market changes. So what we're gonna try and do is provide you with a simple way to look at the market. And we're gonna do that via a data lens, as I believe this is a, an easy way for you to categorize and understand all the solutions that exist out there and ultimately find the solution, if you're looking, that's gonna meet your needs. Now, Jason, I wanna, before we get into all the vendor specific stuff, wanna get some insight from your perspective as a practitioner. What are the latest challenges that you see organizations are faced with today? Well, the scary thing is, Chris, is the latest challenges are challenges that the industry has been dealing with for an enormous amount of time. It unfortunately hasn't really changed too much. I think the biggest thing that has changed is the attack surface and how it's just exploded and what that brings into the ecosystem for security operations centers is the explosion of the amount of data they have to collect, have visibility into and be, be able to utilize to defend their domain. And that really, once you have that explosion of all this telemetry, that just really explodes into the next piece of that puzzle is the ability to collect all that data. I see so many times, and I had to make these decisions when I was in security operations centers myself, is making that unfortunate decision of, what can I afford to collect? What do I have to collect? But if I need other things and I maybe have to pivot or try to grab them, whether an investigation or an incident warrants, but it, that is so inefficient and ineffective. But unfortunately, a lot of organizations today have to deal with that. So the, the ability to collect the data is always a big challenge for organizations. What that also does is it migrates into the ongoing pressures that analysts deal with, whether it is the alert fatigue, because we just have so many different sources that are generating their own alerts and then sending it into the SIM, or it's just telemetry sources that the SIM has got uh, either home uh, homegrown or uh, out of the box alerts that are focusing on that telemetry source. But again, it just explodes onto the level one, but primarily analysts having to sift through all that data and figure out what is real and what is not. I mean, unfortunately, that fatigue situation is still a massive, massive problem to where now, you know, we're, you know, industries are switching to where they even have counseling and, you know, things that are trying to help the fatigue of the analyst. But also when you're talking about all this data and now if you even have the ability to bring it into a central location um you know once you make those decisions of what i have to have the end of the day is a lot of the legacy technologies are not integrated seamlessly or don't have that true collection capability so i'm having to do what either you call it swivel chair ir or the copy and paste workflow to where, you know, I might have something fire in the SIM, but I don't have the rest of the telemetry sources in the SIM to help me conduct my investigations or triage. So now I'm having to copy from the SIM, put it into the native UI, do some digging there, and then I uncover something else. And then I got a copy from there and put it into another UI that may be back to the SIM. It's just a enormous amount of work that is unnecessary in today's industry. I mean, there is technologies that can solve that problem, 
but a lot of organizations still have those legacy sims that they're still dealing with that but again something new no the talent shortage it blows my mind today that there is still i mean what we have on the screen here three points 0.5 million openings in the cybersecurity industry. But the challenge we're dealing with there is maybe someone goes in an organization, they get certified or they get really a, a huge amount of skill capabilities in the SIM or in the, the other technologies. And then they post that on their resume or on their LinkedIn site. And then they're being poached by other organizations. So keeping mm -hmm. the talent once you get it is an enormous problem for every organization trying to keep that talent happy, keep them motivated and keep them from leaving and go into another organization because they have these new new certifications or new skill sets. So when you bundle all three of these issues together, it just becomes something that is constantly keeping whether it's the senior leadership teams or all the way down into the people boots on the ground doing the work. It's just a ever ending battle. Yeah, and I, all great points, Jason. And I think there's another curveball that's been thrown at these teams, uh, probably especially leadership. And it's all the recent news that we've been seeing in the market, whether it's acquisitions or merger of SIM providers. I think it's creating, from what I've been hearing, talking to customers, a lot of uncertainty, um, a lot of distraction for their teams, and ultimately, potentially forced migrations that are unexpected, which is never a fun thing to be forced to go through. Um, and I think this is resulting in teams going out there and looking to evaluate their options. Um, so Jason, I think as someone who's working with security teams right day in, day out, what do you think is keeping them up at night regarding this news uh, specifically? Well, just like you said, Chris, I mean, this all these new announcements in the news with these legacy providers being acquired or mergers and acquisitions that are happening, there's multiple aspects that are keeping people up. From the leadership perspective is, okay, you know, I just invested a lot of money in this technology. I've exhausted an enormous amount of time and resources deploying this technology. It's in, I've got collections and endpoints and all these different components throughout my entire global organization. And now I've got to figure out, you know, am I keeping this? Is the new organization that has maybe acquired my my technology, what are they going to do with this? Am I, am I able to keep it? I mean, are they going to continue to innovate it? Or is it just, you know, they're buying it for the customer base? There's all these questions that pop into leadership's minds is, what do I do now? But it's not just it doesn't just end there when you're talking about from the practitioner side of the house. Again, I might have spent the last few years uh, being certified or being trained to become an expert in this technology. And now leadership is making a hard decision of, well, you know what? I don't want to go down the path where this organization that just acquired my technology is going. So I've got to make that hard decision. Am I going to look elsewhere? And and you know maybe change this out well if that is a decision that is in fact made now you've got anxiety in the analysts because you know they spent a lot of time and energy being experts in this one technology and now they're going to have to learn another or they're going to have to go elsewhere and find another organization that maybe continues to use that technology so that's a big stressful thing and then but again when you're talking about okay leadership has made the decision that they are going to look elsewhere. They're not interested in uh, uh, the new journey that's been thrown at them. So now they got to figure out what is my migration path? How is this going to be the least impactful to my team, to my organization, to my infrastructure, my entire tax surface? It's not just a plug and play and or you you wave the magic wand and all of a sudden everything is up and running from your le your legacy to your new. It just never exists that way. And it's not an easy task to migrate most of the time. So what you got to think about then is, OK, if I am going down this new path and I am going to migrate to a new technology that I'm selecting, who do I engage with? Is it my network team? Is it my SOC team? Is it my analyst, my architecture team? There's my cloud operations. There's so many different components that are involved in this ecosystem. 
I've got to make sure and ensure that all the right resources are involved in not only the decision, but the operational migration path. But when you talk about that, when the, the migration path, you know, when you're doing your research and, you, you know, deciphering the puzzle of what is this next puzzle I'm going to have to build, you know, you've got these major concerns that throw on your doorstep is, you know, what is this new technology that I'm considering? What is their out of the box content? You know, what is their their visualization and, and representation of the data capabilities? You know, am I just going to be staring at lines of code now and I'm not going to have the visualization and reporting that I depended on or, or de need to, to be successful? Also, when you talk about this is, um, you know, from a operational perspective, what are the components that come with this new SIM or these other SIMs that I'm considering? You know, do they have orchestration automation embedded into the offering? And if, if it does, you know, does it do they have playbooks and, and workflows that my team depends upon and, and have relied upon to be successful? Do this does this new technology or new vendor actually offer that? And what is the migration path if they don't? Because a lot of these capabilities are, you know, either written in Python or primarily written in Python, but, you know, what is the migration path there? I've spent the last five years building these playbooks and, and workflows. How easy is it for me to get the, the queries that I'm using or the playbooks that I'm, uh, I'm executing into the new system? That is a huge amount of stress and concern for organization. What is the integration capabilities of these other vendors that I'm evaluating? You know, are they only looking at specific telemetry sources? They only have a very small uh, ingestion capability. Is it like they, you know, they maybe say they can ingest this and, and ingest that, but is their parsers up to date? Is there is their presentation layer where I need it to be? So that was just just those three things alone that I just talked about is going to keep a lot of people up at night just concerned about, OK, if we are going to migrate because leadership is not wanting to stay with the leg, you know, with the legacy product we have because of the new ownership. What is my new team going to do? I, I mean, what is their confidence levels that they can just pick it up and run because they've spent so much an enormous amount of time with their legacy tool? That's not an overnight thing that you just pick it up and learn a new query language or new a new way that you know reports are generated and and your workflows. There's just so many things that you've got to make sure during the evaluation process that all the right resources are involved in that decision. It's not just made at the thirty thousand foot level to say, you know what, I don't want to deal with this new vendor. I'm not that. I, I don't have any other technology in my shop, and I'm not interested in becoming a, one of these shops. So you got to have the entire team involved in the journey because what that's going to do is it's going to what, a couple things. One, it's going to make sure that the team feels that they are enabled, that their voices are heard, that they're valuable to the success of the organization. But it also makes them feel that, you know, they're going to they're set up to succeed. They have a voice. They're being heard and ensuring that, you know, when these decisions are made, if they have a, a input to it, that the right decision is being made, the right technology is being selected instead of just, you know what, this is, we're migrating, here's what you get, figure it out. And by the way, we can't have any exposure during this go. That is not something that people want to hear. That's not something people want to deal with because they're going to panic that one, are we going to have gaps? Are we going to have exposures? Are we going to have exploitations that we're opening up during our transition and migration period? There's a lot of th things that will keep people up right now. Yeah, so I think net net, right? Security is a team sport and it should be yep. a team sport also as you're potentially considering your options, right? Bring, bring along everybody in, to ensure you're going to be successful in that potential project. Um, 100%. It takes a village. <laughs> For real. Um, all right, so now let's focus a bit on the market, right? And get into more specifics about how you can best evaluate the options that are out there. Maybe you haven't been looking at the latest uh, sim players that are 
currently existing. Um, maybe you've been dominated by hearing kind of some of the legacy players over time. What else is out there? So let's let's give you a quick framework that's going to help you evaluate uh, what those options are. Now, the Gartner Magic Quadrant only gets you so far. Uh, this year, there were 22 plus vendors in it. It can still be quite challenging to really ascertain and uh, understand the, the pros, the cons of all of the vendors that are listed in there. So this framework, hopefully, gives you something really practical. Um, so I'm going to do this via a few questions, Jason. Um, so the first one I think is beneficial for organizations to ask themselves is, should I look for a single vendor, all-in-one security platform solution? What would you say, Jason, are the pros and cons of looking or selecting this type of solution? Well, that's it's a tough one because there's always the juggle of, am I looking for best of breed? Am I looking for an all-in-one solution that says we can do everything you need in one-stop shop? You know, there's a couple of things that organizations have to face there is one, this could be a single point of failure in some of their eyes. Secondly, it could be, you know, this is this is a enhancement for me because I'm not having to manage six different vendors when I'm trying to have my operational workflow. So from that regards, you know, the, the biggest thing is you want to have a platform play. You want to have a technology that you're evaluating that I'm not having to go and say, well, I need log collection and analytics here, and then I need orchestration and automation there, and then I need, um, you know, UEBA over here and the different components. You want a platform that is embedded and incorporated together to just provide you with the data that you need and the confidence that you need to make your decisions. You don't want to have to go in and, and piecemeal this back together. We're in the stage of the industry now where it's not needed. So the nice thing about that is when you're making those evaluations, those are things that have to be a part of your checklist is do you have these capabilities? What is your what is your capabilities that you offer as the platform player? And does it meet my needs, right? Do I have everything I, I need that my maybe existing stack was providing to me and I don't wanna have to manage 25 different products to do it? Because that's the crazy thing nowadays. And when you're not going even outside the SIM uh, arena, you know, on average, an organization has, uh, I think it's 75 different technologies in their stack just for security. We're not talking outside of security like IT and, and all the other aspects of the business, just cyber alone at 75 uh, technology pieces in their stack. Well, if you don't have a platform that is, uh, you know, enabled to consume all of those, correlate them together, build out the stories you're you're a dog chasing its tail at that point because you don't really know where to, where do I stop where do I begin it's just crazy yeah I, I think that that's the key point there Jason with with the all-in-one you got to make sure if they're if you are going down the all-in-one path that they better support the data diversity of your environment or else you're back to where you were potentially five years ago trying to pivot across multiple tools yep um all right uh, another question that's helpful to ask yourself is, do I build my security stack around my cloud service providers offering? Uh, interesting, right? There's a number of these now in market today. What are some of the pros and cons of, of going down that path, Jason? Well, there, there, is a, there is both. There is pros and cons of that. I mean, obviously, the big cloud providers are jumping into the cyber world. They have the, the infrastructure, the storage, and the compute capabilities in their ecosystem already. Um, some of the challenges I've seen in talking, like I'm, I'm living in the trenches with cyber teams every day. Um, some of the challenges that I'm hearing a lot about is some of these cloud providers that are offering this, these components, they do great with their own data sources, their own telemetry sources. They have out-of-the-box content built. They have whatever they, their offerings, they work very well with their tech stack and their, their uh, data sources. But when you try to bring in the third parties, there's challenges that arise, whether they just don't have parsers, they don't have ingestion capabilities, they just, they don't have out of the box content. So it becomes more of a, all right, now I'm having to manage this like I built the SIM myself. And it's like, what's is there value there to me well yeah you know the, the back end to compute the storage and all those things that's a big thing from the pricing model and 
and all of that. But from an operational perspective, that could become a nightmare. So those, I mean, those are things that you, you got a way of, you know, when you're evaluating, do I build on top of my data lake or my cloud provider, or do I go with a vendor that is built on a cloud infrastructure, but already has the capabilities to work with everybody, not, not be, you know, be agnostic, not being like just focusing on what their, their telemetry sources provide. Yeah, I absolutely agree with all that. And I think there's also that element of, do you want your your security plane to exist in your operational environment, right? So if one is compromised, yes. could the other potentially as well? You know, this proverbial oh, fox guarding the hen house. Yeah, um, yes. something to keep in mind. Fox guarding the hen house. Yes, yes, hundred um, percent. All right, next question to ask: Do I look at the traditional sims that are out there? Like, well, Curator was considered traditional. They're now, you know, making the move over to a different vendor, their customers. But maybe a Splunk, right? What what are the pros and cons of going with something that maybe has been in that Gartner Magic Quadrant uh, leaders area for ten years? Well, I mean, you're always wanting. I mean, it's funny you mentioned a little bit ago about you know all the new players in the Quadrant now, right? It's always mind blowing when you walk into the RSA or the Black Hat showroom floors, and there's. 50 new vendors and even just the sim space popping up out of the blue. And you're like, okay, they're offering the latest, this, the latest, that the latest, this, but they haven't been truly battle tested. They haven't been proven. Um, you know, they, they have a great story that maybe they're telling, but they have not really proved themselves. So it's always a scary journey. If you're, you know, you're going to judge that book by its cover for that matter. Um, I think it's always a very good approach that you're going to look at someone that's been around for you know many many years that have been battle tested and proven has a, a significantly large customer base that you know has the community collaboration you know things that they're offering that it's like you're not in this journey alone um, you know you need to make sure that it's just not you know a few guys in a back room in a garage that built some components on a a back end technology and and threw some you know fancy charts on the top of it because what value is that bringing to you so it's 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 a hard thing to look at there when you're talking about if i'm looking at the quadrant where did where do all these players sit because we all know a lot of the players like i talked about in black hat showroom floor or the rsa or whatever those conferences a lot of them are even in a quadrant. So does that mean it's a non-starter? Not necessarily, but you have to do your due diligence and find out, you know, how long have they been around? I mean, what are they offering and what their stability is and everything else that comes along with that? Yeah, I, all, all good points again. And I think related to that, that question is around um, valuating maybe smaller solutions, right? That they may have generally narrower security set of capabilities or number of use cases that they address. Um, I think it's important to go out and say, do I need something that has the breadth of my current SIM or can I go more narrow? What are some of the pros and cons, Jason, of maybe paring down your capabilities or go scaling up and saying, I need more use cases? Like how, how do you approach that kind of view and looking at the market? Well, with that regards, it comes back to the explosion of the attack surface. Right. And it's not even just the attack surface now that we're looking at from a cyber perspective is all data can be security data. Right. It doesn't necessarily mean it's coming from my EDR. It's coming from my firewall. It's coming from my IDS, whatever those are, that 75 stack, because I can't tell you how many times I've been doing incident response and come to find out once I start peeling that onion of the investigation, I come to find out, well, there's a data source in there. I'm not putting, I was never putting or even considered putting in my SIM, but I need that. And those there's artifacts and, and, and very, very powerful data pieces that would help me in my detections or my IR workflows that I'd never even thought about putting into the SIM. So that's one aspect of that. But when you're also talking about like the SIM that are coming out with single use cases, I don't know any really true uh, uh, security teams that are going to put their apples in a one trick pony. They're just not. Mm -hmm. They're really, I mean, right now we're all so strapped with resources, you know, those 3.5 million unfulfilled jobs and the, the burnouts of my teams and, and so on and so forth. So 
if I'm going to go down a path of evaluating a sim, I need this thing to be robust and do a lot of the work for me and provide that, you know, eliminate the the restriction of, oh, that's a data source we don't we don't support. We have out of the box content. We have you know workflows, all these different things. That's what teams are looking for. They want to make yeah. their lives easier, not more complex and, and more challenging. Absolutely. All right. So on that note, right, so I think those four questions hopefully kind of give you a good idea of how to evaluate the different options out there and how you can think about that. And it's evident that right, there are pros and there are cons with each. And it's really going to come down to what's important to you and how you value the different capabilities of the different solutions that exist out there and how it's going to best support your team. Um, but what if there was a way that you could meet all of the needs that you require without needing to compromise uh, with the solution that you end up choosing. Fortunately, there is a way to do that, and that is with a security data platform. Now, I'm going to give you some of the key characteristics of what a security data platform provides. It ensures that you're able to ingest and collect all the data that you require at any scale so you can achieve that visibility across the disparate data sources and the, the sprawling nature of your operational environment. It's going to provide you with the real-time alerts and analytics and insights into those data sources to fuel your security operations team and give them the, the insights that need about threat actors in their environment. It's going to enable your team to achieve unlimited real-time data access, which is really critical during an investigation or incident response. You don't want to be hindered or hampered by the amount of queries that the data access and is it at your fingertips to actually assess and understand what is going on in your environment at a very critical time. It also provides a broad set of analytics and use cases, as Jason was talking about, right? You want to make sure that you your solution is going to provide all that in a single platform based on your set of use case needs. So a key thing that it also provides. And then lastly, it delivers self-service multi-tenancy, which is great for service providers who are looking to build on a, on a great data platform for their, their service offering. But it also is excellent and well-suited for multinational organizations that need to achieve data residency in order to meet compliance. And this is what comprises a data platform. So the solution that provides all of this and more is Devo. And our security data platform enables our customers and other organizations globally to achieve limitless visibility by being able to ingest the data that they need from any source at any volume. And this is all thanks to our proprietary HyperStream technology that sits at the core of our platform. HyperStream is also what fuels our platform's end-to-end -end security capabilities. And what we're talking about here are the, the things we hear about day in, day out in, in this part of the, the market, which is SIM, SOAR, as well as UEBA, right? So we're talking about that multi-use case support that is baked into the platform. Our platform also includes an AI-powered technology called DeepTrace, which provides autonomous threat hunting as well as investigation capability that's designed to augment the security team and accelerate their ability to address and investigate more threats uh, co uh, cohesively um, and very deeply so that they can understand is this a true positive or not. And every Devo deployment also includes Devo Exchange, which is our application and content marketplace. And this helps teams not only get started out of the gate, but also ensures that they have what they need as their operations evolve. If, as they move into a new environment or adopt a new application, do they have the content that they can use to get going with effectively? So the, our, the Devo security data platform provides everything that you need for your SOC and more. It's a solution that's easy to stand up, get value with quickly, and gain confidence so that you know you'll be able to handle data at any scale, not only today, but in the future. And you don't have to take just my word for it. Uh, we have thousands of organizations worldwide who have realized immense value and success from our platform, whether it's significantly reducing the manual investigation workload that analysts are faced with, massively increasing the query speed, which really fuels all the processes of the SOC, as well as the automation that SOCs are looking to deploy, while also providing a massive increase in visibility across their environment. And this is really key, especially as for organizations that are do a lot of M&A or have a kind of disparate kind of organizational business unit structure. They want to be able to achieve a singular view of their security posture in a single place. And the Devo Security plat data platform allows you to do that. All right. So 
that that's what I wanted to talk about in the Devo standpoint. I hope you found all of this Devo information helpful, as well as all the market insight that Jason was taking you through in terms of how to view and assess the market and your needs. Um, if you're still interested in wanting to learn more, right, we urge you to head over to Devo.com. Um, and if you want to understand and assess the market in general, you can go ahead and grab your free copy of the Gartner Magic Quadrant for Sim found on our site. Uh, in this year's report, Devo is ranked as a visionary and also gives you a good assessment of all the players in the space. All right, so let's see. I think from here, we're going to move over into Q&A and see if we have any Q&A that is available for us to address. Let me take a look here. All right, so we've got one question, Jason, um, which is, can you talk about how Devo helps analysts avoid burnout specifically? Well, yeah, I mean, it, that's a multi-pronged question right there. So there's so many aspects of how analysts get burnt out. But the biggest one we all know is the alert fatigue and the, the copy-paste swivel chair workflows. So a couple of things around that is Devo is obviously being able to provide in a single location all your data sources via the hyperstream engine. There's not a data source that I have to say, you know, my God, I'm like doing that onion peeling and I wish I would have had this data source there. Now I got to pivot and go out and, and, and look for it. It's eliminating that from the equation, which does cause burnout, but also the orchestration and automation components that come along with the Devo platform, being able to automate a lot of those mundane steps that you, know, you tr traditionally would have to do when you're triaging and even just investigating these incidents, having the ability to automate a lot of those things. Again, whether you're talking about alert fatigue or you're talking about investigative fatigue, or you're talking about even managing the data fatigue. There's so many different aspects that gets the analysts burnt out about this, where the platform itself can help with all aspects about that. When you're talking about the community and, you know, the collaboration that our community provides and out of the box content that we share, there's so many different aspects that cause burnout that we are helping eliminate. Awesome. Thank you, Jason. And it looks like those were all the questions that we had in queue at this time. Um, but before we go, I got one more thing to, to share and talk to everyone about, and that is the third annual Sock Analyst Appreciation Day that we're hosting this fall. Um, it's going to be here right before we know it. And if you're unfamiliar with this day, it's all about honoring the unsung heroes of the organization, the Sock Analyst. Uh, and the cornerstone of the event is the Analyst Award Program. This, these awards allow organizations to nominate and recognize their analysts on their team who go above and beyond and handle all their very pressure packed jobs really, really well. Uh, nominations are now open and I encourage you to go visit the link below sockanalystday.com forward slash award to submit nom you have as many nominations as you wish for your security team. It's a great opportunity to say thanks and also enter them into a larger running where we have some third party judges who are going to assess them based on a variety of different award categories. And those award winners will receive prizes, as you can see there on the slide. So get your submission in by July 12th. Um, and again, I want to thank everybody for joining today. I think this was an awesome conversation. Thank you, Jason, for your time. And we hope to see you again soon. Thanks, all. Thanks, everybody.